Avram Alpert works to understand what values we can live by in a world as connected, chaotic, and potentially catastrophic as the present. He is currently researching for a new book about what it might mean, mean to be wise in such a world, as well working on several related creative writing projects. He is the author of three previous books, most recently The Good Enough Life. In addition to his writing, he is also deeply interested in developing institutions that connect the humanities to pressing political concerns. He's a, at present a fellow in, at one such place, the New Institute in Hamburg. For his talk at the NFU convention, he will discuss the ethical and philosophical arguments in favor of networks of collaboration as opposed to concentrations of power. Avram, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, uh, what an honor to be here. I apologize, it's a bit late here in, in Europe, so um, I am not as fresh as, as some of you might be, but it's real, I, I was uh, so excited by the opportunity to come and, and uh, engage with you all. Um, and to be on this excellent panel, I think the, the talks will flow somewhat naturally from each other, although we're all discussing different aspects uh, of the problem. And as I was thinking about the, the theme of uh, confronting con concentration and what I could contribute as someone who, who has not spent much time on, on farms um, or whose, whose work is primarily with writing, uh, was to ask kind of, you know, what is, as a writer, as, as someone who works with the philosophy, what could I contribute to thinking about how, um, what, what kinds of human, what it means to be a human being or, or what kinds of creatures or, or you know what is something like human nature uh, not as as pauline was saying not that that reduces us to one way of understanding things but what the possibilities are and what we might share so i want to talk a little bit about how concentration goes against uh, what i think are some of the best aspects uh, of what it means to be a human being how concentration goes against the kinds of uh, joys um, and and bonds that that we can form when we work together through cooperation rather than through these kind of top-down hierarchies. Uh, essentially, what I'll try to talk about is how the image of life, uh, the image of what it means to be human that we get from defenses of concentration and corporate power uh, goes against the very nature of the things that they, they promise. It promises us a life that's going to be better, more fulfilling, more enriching, but in fact reduces us to kinds of survivalists, uh, to a kind of efficiency model of human life. Whereas in fact, we are beings who care about decency, humility, uh, compassion, care, uh, and that the kinds of things we should try to cultivate is this kind of cooperative mentality where this comes out. So I'll try and kind of lay out some of the philosophical framework of that and take us back to some of the roots of, of capitalism and, and where I think we went a little bit wrong. Um, so let me begin just by by trying to say what's what's the best argument for concentration? I think we kind of hear these all the time, but I like to be fair as, as best I can to interlocutors. So. I think one of the things that we hear a lot is, look, the world is incredibly complicated. Uh, democracy can be very messy. Uh, when there's a lot of voices in the room, it's hard to kind of bring everything together. And so what are we best to do? Well, if we can find the most talented people, uh, the smartest people, or even sometimes just the most ruthless people, they'll do what needs to get done, right? If we kind of try and put all of us in a room and we try and figure it out, we'll debate forever, or we'll uh, never quite arrive at a solution. And the kinds of things we need to confront in the future, uh, massive scale climate change, uh, this kind of ongoing issues with inequality. In fact, the best way to deal with it by the, the concentration argument is, is to find these best, most talented, give them the resources, let them come up with the technologies, uh, the ways of being, uh, um, the, the new forms of life that will then filter down to the rest of us. And we may not wind up living the most perfect life because of that, but we'll survive. We'll have decency. Uh, it'll be okay. Um, and the, the metrics for this, you, you hear sometimes, right? If you look at the, the history of the statistics of the global population, as best as we can understand them, which is somewhat imperfectly, but life expectancy is rising, infant mortality is declining, uh, poverty in absolute terms is arguably declining. Uh, you have to fudge the numbers a little bit to get there. Uh, hunger is somewhat declining also, uh, but we're not quite there in many ways. You know, 40% of the world's population still lives on 550 or less a day. 
And the, the argument that we hear, though, is if we just keep con concentrating more and more, if we keep get, focusing the power, getting it into the right hands, uh, eventually this is going to trickle down. And sure, other people are going to live better. Other people are going to have access to, to more education, to longer life expectancies, uh, uh, to, to better goods and services. Uh, but everyone else is going to be OK. Um, and my sense is that this completely confounds, this completely gets wrong what it actually means to live a, a good human life. And I, I use the phrase often for this, that in fact, instead of thinking about good lives uh, or lives that are sufficient, right, lives that just kind of meet the bare minimum, less mortality, less poverty, uh, we should think about ourselves as good enough beings. Uh, what I mean by this is a few things. One, we do need enough, right? It does matter that we have the material things uh, that get us by. We do need enough food and we do need to, uh, to have housing and, and heating or cooling, depending where you are. Um, of course, right, we are material beings. We are, we are embodied, we live in the world, we, we require this. Um, but we're also spiritual beings or symbolic beings or meaning-making beings, how, however it makes sense for you to, to put it. We require goodness. We require decency. We, we require the ability to have care, to care for others, to be part of communities, to show love, to be loved. Um, these two things cannot be separated. So when I say good enough, I don't mean just uh, enough to get by, right? I mean this connection, this thing that refuses to separate goodness and sufficiency as if they were two parts. Uh, we are one being and these two things are, are united in us. I also though do mean that this is not going to be perfect, right? Sometimes what we hear from the greatness arguments is if we just give like enough to the best people for long enough, eventually they're going to make everything kind of wonderful for everyone and no one will ever die and everything will be perfect. And this again, just misunderstands how we are, right? We are flawed, right? We're not perfect. Religions have various ways of interpreting this, but we also just know it between ourselves, right? Sometimes we are a bit tired and we say the wrong thing or we're hungry and we yell at our partner or, or our child or, or whatever it might be. Um, this is part of our condition. And if we refuse this, if we don't embrace this, then we, we start to think of ourselves as perfectible, as on our way to perfection, instead of people who don't always know the answer, right? Who don't always know the correct thing to do or say in any given moment or what the right decision is, and therefore cannot have a single person, a single concentration that's able to tell the rest of us what the right thing to do is, because we're all flawed, because none of us knows the right answer. So we're all good enough. We all need goodness and enoughness, and we all need to embrace this kind of imperfection. Uh, I, I should say this is not a philosophy that I invented. I, I've kind of moved it from somewhere else. And, and I take it from the psychotherapist, Donald Winnicott. And, and Winnicott's ideas are very simple. He, he worked with children, uh, middle of the 20th century, he worked with families and children. And he looked at these parents who were trying to be what he saw kind of as great parents, perfect parents. And anytime a child would cry or have any kind of problem, they'd rush in and they'd, they'd try to fix the problem right away. And Winnicott saw a few things happening. One, the stress on the parent, on the person trying to concentrate all the, the goodness and trying to have everything you know, perfect um, was too much. And they weren't able to live up to it because no, no one can. But also it wasn't even good for the child, even if they were able to take away the suffering or the pain for the child, that they were stealing more from their children than they realized. Because part of life is dealing with imperfection, is dealing with problems, children need to confront these limitations. And in so doing, that's how their creativity grows. That's how their adaptability grows. That's how they become different kinds of, of agents who are able to interact with others, understand others' difficulties and frustrations, not become obsessed with, with you know, never fe feeling pain or difficulty, but really appreciating each other. And so Winnicott, of course, didn't then say, well, don't be a good parent, right? He said, be a good enough parent, right? Make sure you're still providing enough to your children uh, materially, uh, but also be good, right? Be caring, be loving, be decent. And I think this explains so much uh, about what we need in life uh, uh, and what kind of life we should strive to have. It's not one where we are fighting each other to get to the top of a limited pyramid, right? Uh, some of the things that I think both Amber and, and Pauline touched on, right? This is what neoliberalism does to us. Uh, it forces us into these kind of narrow slots and says there's only so much goodness in the world and either you get a slice of it or you settle for, for enoughness. Uh, but in fact, we, we need to kind of work together on ensuring this, this connected good enoughness. Now, one person who I think maybe surprisingly uh, understood this very well was Adam Smith. Uh, and people who know Adam Smith probably know him as the so-called founder of capitalism or father of capitalism from his book, The Wealth of Nations in, in 1776, published 1776. 
Uh, but this was not Smith's uh, only book. Of course, he was a professor of moral philosophy. Um, like a lot of us, he really thought, you know, what does it mean to, to live well, to have a decent life, to, to get by in this world in a meaningful way? And so when Smith wrote The Wealth of Nations, he sort of realized that when people don't have enough, it becomes very difficult to, to live a decent life. And he wanted to understand how it was, right, that we could make a world uh, where things were materially easier. And once enoughness was met, then perhaps we could talk about the kinds of, of goodness. Um, I should say that even here, right, there's some problems. Uh, we do know from just either if you know people who who, who live with uh, very limited means or if you've read accounts of it, um, that you can live on very little money, you can live on poverty and still have joy and still have pleasure and still have decency. The reason to eradicate this is because it's it's wrong. It's not because it's necessarily always the most unpleasant thing in the world. And this beautiful book uh, by Viktor Frankl, if people don't know, called Man's Search for Meaning. We might better today say, you know, people's search for meaning. Um, but what, what Franco, you know, using man at, at the time as that generic term in, in the 1950s, he had come through uh, Auschwitz, he'd come through the concentration camps in, in Germany, um, and he realized that, uh, 10 minute warning, thanks. Um, he realized that, right, if, if people um, had, he quotes the philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, if people had a why, they could go through any how, right? Which is to say, if you knew what you live for, if your life had a meaning, you could go through whatever you had to go through. Uh, Franco never said that this justified anything. He never said you had to suffer, but he just sort of said, meaning is, is part of what drives us. And, and if we're able to connect that meaning to lives that are decent, right? this is, what, this is the, the holy grail. This is what we're searching for. Um, and so just to say, right, from, from Smith's idea that, you know, if you don't have uh, material decency, nothing is good. It's just a sort of saying, you can have enoughness without goodness. You can also have some goodness even without enoughness, but the point is to, to connect them. So anyway, so Smith had written these other books. Uh, one of them that um, is very important is called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. Uh, Smith wrote it, he finished it around 1759. Uh, and then he wrote The Wealth of Nations, finished that about 20 years later. And then he re-edited the theory of moral sentiments, the last thing he does kind of before he dies in 1790. So this is a book that he thinks about through his life. And for people who know Adam Smith as a person who says, okay, what grows wealth is self-interest. What grows wealth is people looking out for themselves, pursuing what they need to do, and eventually maybe, you know, this kind of sorts itself out and it's going to be okay. It's very interesting to read the theory of moral sentiments because what he says there is people pursuing their own wealth is the greatest corrupter of human virtue. Right? These seem like totally opposite points. Smith basically says, if people try to be great and they try to be wealthy, they're going to destroy themselves in the social world. And then in the wealth of nations where we get, you know, this kind of theory of capitalism from, he's really saying, oh, this is, this is what you have to do. You have to pursue wealth. And by pursuing your own wealth, you're helping everybody out. So how do we, how do we understand this contradiction? Well, Smith, like, like Frankel or, or like Winnicott was uh, someone who thought very seriously about the human condition, right? What does it mean to be uh, a human being? And, and what do we seek? What do we want in this life? What do we need in this life? And Smith says, uh, if we study, just like Winnicott studied, you study children, you study what they see on the playground or, or what they see as they walk through town, um, you find that what, it, what do children want? Well, what we all want, not just to be loved, right? But to be worthy of love, right? To be someone who is good enough, who's caring enough, who's meaningful enough, who contributes enough that they should be loved. And so what, it, what does the child see when, when the child looks around the world? Same in, in Smith's time in the 18th century as in ours, do they see that the people who are good and caring and virtuous, do they receive the most attention, the most uh, 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 most love, most care, most, most uh, focus? No, right, who does? Well, the rich and the powerful. And so what does the child start to want? Well, they wanna be rich and powerful too. They see that you can be a terrible person and be rich and powerful and become president of the most powerful country in the world for a time, right? So if you have this world where, where this happens, uh, of course, people are going to want excess. They're going to want to be among the great in the world, even though, as Smith has told us, this is what corrupts us. This is what tears us apart. This is what rips the social fabric and leaves us as the kinds of uh, analysis that Amber, Amber did so wonderfully, right? Leaves us as these kind of individuals uh, fighting, fighting these difficult battles that we're better off to do together. So Smith is totally aware of this, but he says, well, what can we do? This is just human nature. This, you know, we look at this, we want to be loved. This is who we see being loved. What are we going to do? And so Smith has this, I think, kind of, kind of crazy theory. And he says, well, look, it's okay 
don't worry, because if you own all the fields in Canada, you can't eat all the food from those fields. You have to sell them to people. Uh, so it's going to be all right. You're going to grow all your produce and you'll find somebody to sell it to. And that person will have to have enough of an income that they'll be able to buy it from you. Um, and because wealth is all about showing it, it's all about showing that you're loved and, and cared for and respected. Well, you're going to need to buy what he calls trinkets and baubles, you know, lots of kind of random things. And so the money's going to circulate and Smith thinks eventually it'll be as if we had divided the world equally. He says in the theory of moral sentiments, the invisible hand will distribute it such that we'll all be equal again. And of course, we've seen very clearly, and again, as we've seen in the presentations today, both for economic reasons and for, for social reasons, reasons of identity, this is not at all what happens. So one thing I think we can we can think about not only right or, or what are the alternatives, but also what history has gone wrong here, right? Why, why did we come to think that there was only one trajectory, that there was only kind of one path if we have to grow wealth in this particular way? And one of the other things we learned reading Smith is that he, like a lot of uh, philosophers at the time, were reading accounts of indigenous life in the Americas, in Canada, in the United States, in Peru, in Mexico, and really seeing. Uh, through these very distorted lenses that according to them, right, according to what they saw, uh, indigenous peoples were living what, what the another philosopher, Thomas Hobbes, called nasty, brutish, and short lives. And so the idea was, as long as we don't kind of run through this system, right, where we're kind of pulling all the land out of the commons, giving it to the few, letting them grow, and then having them recirculated, as Smith describes, we're going to stay stuck at these subsistence levels. And what we've learned so much over the past few centuries is, as people have overturned <clears throat> uh, this, this kind of Eurocentric vision of the world is that, of course, this was never what life was like. Of course, indigenous peoples everywhere, like peoples everywhere have problems, uh, but they also had right decency, they had care, they had community, they had ways of thinking about how the world works in, in all sorts of ways, right? Some, some that we may draw on today, some that we may want to find other ways of, of engaging. Um, but part of the point here is just to say in, in this Smith model of things, right, the reason that there's only one path to wealth is because he doesn't understand the world as it is. He doesn't understand the other possibilities for how to live. He doesn't understand things like cooperative democratic practices, which we know, for example, that the Iroquois had in, in the northern United States. Um, he doesn't see that this is a possibility for human life. He only sees one path. And I think part of the things that we can do is to remind ourselves of these other histories, engage them also as they inform the present, especially in, in, in Canadian life, um, and, and bring them bring them along with us. The one, the one thing I also just kind of want to close on here is, one thing that I'm told sometimes, well, you know, when you say things like this about, well, we all just need a good enough life and <clears throat> we should, you know, no one should be too much better than anyone else. And you're I, just about bare sufficiency for everyone else is that people say, well, you're just envious, right? You just wish you had this money or this ability or whatever. And I think this completely misunderstands what it, what it envy is. Uh, if, if I'm envious of someone, it's not that I want what they have. It's that I want to have what they have as well, right? So if I if if you have a good relationship with your uh, um, brother, uh, I don't have a brother, but if I had a brother and I had a bad relationship with him, uh, but I wanted a good relationship like yours, I wouldn't want to take your relationship, right? I would want to share the. I would also want to have this for myself. We're not talking here about people wanting to take something from someone else. We're talking about trying to create the conditions by which all of us can have these kind of good relationships, right? We're talking about the the kind of world in which what we what we should envy is in fact a world where everyone has decency and sufficiency. And so what I've tried to argue, just to kind of sum up here, is that even at the heart of the system that has concentrated so much capital and so much power in the ideas of Adam Smith, there is originally a, a claim that the purpose of our life isn't just material gain. The material gain is simply a, a path toward uh, the kinds of virtues, the kinds of love and care and decency that make our life worth living. And so if anyone ever says to us, okay, yes, we're going to concentrate capital. Yes, we're going to narrow in. Uh, only some people are going to have access to the best things, but everyone else is going to survive. Then we can say very clearly, you know, no, you have misunderstood what it means to be a human being, what is valuable in this life, that what matters to us, what matters for all of us is decency, is care, is this goodness alongside that, that enoughness, that sufficiency, and that the kind of world that we're fighting for is not one where some are great and everyone else is left behind or just gets a bare minimum, but a world in which we are all able to live these good enough, caring, decent, sufficient lives. Um, thank you so much for your time, uh, and, and I look forward to, to engaging more in the Q&A. Thank you.
Avram Alpert. Thank you very much, Avram.